good morning, church family, and we are so glad that you are with us once again uh, on our online platform to be able to worship with you. We hope that you've had a great week and you've come ready to hear from God and worship Jesus Christ uh, this morning. As we just uh, begin this morning, we just have a few announcements to share with you. Uh, the first announcement is we have uh, exciting news uh, to share with, uh, with you about our Love the City Week. And the, traditionally in the past, we've done a Love the City Week, which has been the first week of July. This year, because of COVID and light of uh, our world circumstances, we are doing things a little bit different. Uh, we have two ways in which you could participate with Love the City. We are going to go all the way throughout the summer. We're going to have different projects throughout the summer. Our first project that we're going to do is a fundraising campaign for pizza. And there's two ways you can participate in, 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 in this uh, fundraiser and love the city. The first one is we want to be able to provide pizza lunches um, as a way of encouragement to our community leaders and our community organizations. So we want to be able to bless our politicians. We want to be able to bless our school teachers. We want to be able to bless um, our our community workers, and just let them know that we love them, we are thinking about them, and we are thanking them for what they have done in, inside of our city. The other way we want to uh, encourage you to participate in our pizza fundraiser is that we've partnered with Lions Oval, one of the schools that we've grown uh, a close relationship with, and uh, they have grads who are going to be graduating at the end of this month. And what we thought would be a good idea is that we would be able to provide our, the graduating class of Lions Oval for 2020 uh, to be able to give them a pizza dinner for their family and also a small gift of just thank you and way to go and, and congratulations for graduating elementary school. And so if you're interested in participating, you could, for the price of $10, be able to provide um, pizza either for a community leader or for a uh, Lions Oval graduation student. So if you're interested in partnering with us in that, you can reach out to Josh at josh.gray at emmanuelaurelia.org or call the church office. And, and, uh, and if you also want to be a part of handing out those pizzas and delivering those pizzas to the various different environments, uh, you can connect with Josh and he can let you know more about that. Our other announcement comes in the way of day camp. Uh, we love kids and we love day camp. And so we, uh, with our kids community and True North team, uh, we are committed to providing a form of day camp this summer. We don't know exactly what that's going to look like, but we do know that we are going to provide something in the way of day camp. That could be a day camp in the box, or that could be some form of in-person day camp. We just don't know yet. This is what we do know. There will be something, and we will be able to get you more information in the weeks ahead as we learn about what the restrictions are and what the removal of those restrictions are. Stay tuned for those details uh, as we move ahead. And also, um, one of the downfalls of being able to... Uh, uh, pre-record these services is that we just don't, we, we record on Tuesdays and we can't have the access to come in. So um, on Sunday, when if you're watching this, there may be um, some more information on, on this upcoming Sunday gathering. Uh, we want to encourage you to look on our Facebook, look on our website, and also look for an email, special email, to allow you to know what, when are, we're, we're regathering, what that looks like, all the details when it comes to regathering in uh, our church building. Well, church family, we are hope that you are ready to worship. I'm going to hand it off to, to Matt and a whole slew of team as they lead us to worshiping Jesus Christ this morning. between us by a cross you came and broke them down you broke them down there were chains around us by your grace we are no longer bound no longer bound you call me out of the grave you call me into the light you call my name and then I came alive your love is greater your love is stronger Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Give God 
in robes of white. The blazing sun shall pierce this night, and I will rise from the stains. My gaze transfixed on Jesus' face. Oh, praise the Oh, praise the Is any wonderful thing 
Well, thank you, worship team, for leading us in that worship. We are so grateful that we could come together, wherever we are, whatever platform, wherever we're watching, to be able to worship Jesus Christ. As we continue to worship Jesus, would you just bow in a word of prayer with me? Father, we humbly come into your presence, and we want to confess that we truly want to worship you. We thank you that this morning we can come before you, no matter where we are, no matter when we're watching, and we can enter into your presence. We know that you're a God that longs for us to come to you. You're a God that longs for us to come and lift up our requests to you. And so, God, this Sunday we want to come before you, and we want to lift up our requests to you. We want to pray boldly. We want to pray specifically. And we want to pray um, knowing that you hear our prayers. God, you know in our church family that there have been some who have lost loved ones. We've been praying for them week after week after week. And we know that this past week, uh, Roger Barnes um, was a part of the, uh, the graveside internment of his dear wife, Irene. Father, that was a tough time. That was hard. God, I pray that you would be with Roger in this week. I pray that you would remind him that you're a God of comfort, that you can comfort those who are grieving. And so, Father, I pray that this week, as he has just experienced that, that you would be with him, that you would be near him. We also pray for others who have lost loved ones this past year. We think of Ruth. We think of Doreen. We think of Dot. We think of Julie. We think of Elaine. Uh, we think of Vera. Father, we do pray that they would continue to trust you, continue to lean into you, and continue to find comfort and strength in this difficult time through you. God, we, uh, we, we, we're also asking that you would give us wisdom as a church family, as a leadership staff, in what this looks like in regathering. Father, we long to come and be together we long to come and hear from your word together. We long to come and lift up our voices so that we can hear each other lifting up our voices together. God, as our government has lifted some of the restrictions, we're just continuing to ask that you give us wisdom, that you'd help us to know how to respond to that, how to respond in a way that would honor you, that we would continue to just long to be together as a church, look to be together as a church, so God, we're just asking that you would just give us wisdom as we consider how to regather properly. Father, we know in our world today that we are facing a lot of turmoil, not just simply with COVID, but with a lot of racial discrimination, a lot of racial tension. Father, we know that in 1 Peter 3 that you tell us that we are to be like-minded, you tell us that we need to be sympathetic towards each other. You tell us that we need to love one another. You tell us that we need to be compassionate and humble as Christians. Father, you tell us that we are, should not repay evil with evil or insult with insult, but rather we ought to pay evil with blessing. So Father, I pray that the church globally the church specifically in the United States would respond in a way that would be honoring to you. Father, may you find your people reflecting your image in this time, in this tension. God, would you do that among 
um, all of around the globe. Father, we think of our global partners in India. We don't want to forget about them. I pray that you would just constantly be with them. Would you give them wisdom to know how to respond to the cyclone and, 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 and the devastation there? God, we pray for their protection. We pray that you would use this in a way that would be a catalyst for them to be able to share the good news of, and the hope of Jesus Christ. So God, we pray for them. And God, as we continue to look forward into our, our online worship gathering this morning, we want to pray for John Fitter as he comes and opens up your word and speaks to us. God, we want to confess, we want to hear from you. We want ears to listen. We want a heart that is moldable. And we want lives that would be transformed because what we are going to hear. So God, I pray that you would speak through John this morning. Guide us, lead us. May he be like a prophet to us and speak in a way that we ought to hear. And may we not just be listeners of your word, but I pray that we be doers of your word this morning. So God, be with John. Be with us who are listening to this sermon. Speak to us, we pray. And we pray all of these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Well, church family, it is my great delight and my honor to be able to introduce to you this morning a good friend of mine, a pastor that I've worked alongside of, a, a guy that I've learned from in, in a deep way. His name is John Fitter. Uh, he used to be at a harvest in Muskoka. He used to be here uh, at Emmanuel in the Berry campus. And believe it or not, he used to be here at the Old Bethel in this building. And it gives me great honor to be able to introduce to you and have him come and share and open up God's word to you this morning. Uh, I hope that you are ready to hear from God through John this morning. God bless you as you hear him speak. Hello, Emmanuel Aurelia family. Uh, good to be with you today, wherever you are watching this, uh, in your living room or on your phone outside. I'm glad that you tuned in today. Some of you might recognize my face. Uh, I used to hang out at, Ema at Emmanuel and Barry before as a youth guy. And before that, actually a long time before that, right here, I did some of my very first teaching when this was uh, Bethel Baptist in Aurelia. Uh, I, if you struggle to recognize who I am, I do not blame you. I have completely lost something, and I've completely gained something since those days. But enough about me. Let's get into God's Word. That's why we've gathered in this way. We're hungry for Him to speak to us. So if you've got your, your copy of God's Word, the Bible, in your hands, I want you to turn with me to 1 Peter. 1 Peter's where we're going to be hanging out today. But i got to say this, because I've been where you are right now, on your couch, and sometimes the Bible's just a couple feet away from you right now. I encourage you, take the time, get up, grab that Bible, even if your name's Rob Knight, and I want you to get a copy of that word in your hand, because you're going to be hanging out there, okay? And if you don't have a Bible, you happen to be tuning in, maybe this is your first time, and you don't own a Bible, you can find good apps online right now, but after this sermon, I totally want you to call the office here. They're going to hook you up with a Bible and make sure you get a Bible into your home that you can reference at any time. I hope you're there right now. We're in First Peter, but uh, one thing that you're going to see if you're already turned to chapter 4 is that we are actually almost closer to the end of a letter that Peter has written to the churches um, in modern day Turkey. Now, the, the thing about that is when you jump into a letter, or maybe you've jumped into a story halfway, or when you're in high school, you skipped a few chapters hoping that your reading assignment would be a little bit, would be a little bit shorter, but then you get lost and you're not really sure what's going on. Um, it's important to understand the whole context. Uh, if you ask my wife, I, I will come in halfway into a movie and I've got lots of questions. So she just learns just to pause it, answer what's going on, and tells me a little bit about the background Then I can be quiet and watch the movie. So my hope is to give you a little bit of context and then we're going to get into the meat of what we're going to talk about in chapter 4. So context-wise, why don't you turn just one page back with me. We're going to start in chapter 1. I'm just going to read the first couple of verses because I think that the Apostle Peter just teased us up for the rest of the letter that he's writing to these churches. Why don't you look into God's word with me? It says this in uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the 
foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with His blood. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. Now, this is an introduction to a letter, and there's a ton in this letter. And this is not that different from a lot of introductions you'll see in the New Testament. But what we find here is what he's going after. As a, maybe a little bit of a side note, of maybe a pastoral side note, if you will, I love how the whole Trinity is being shown to be involved in your salvation, Christian. Do you see that? The Father, the Son, the Spirit have all been a part of choosing you and calling you into the kingdom of God. And in that way, they have, they have all played their role in transforming you from one that is a citizen of the kingdom of darkness to the citizen that is the kingdom of light. So I, I, first off, you know, side note, I love that part of these couple of verses. But here we find out a few things about, about this book that we're going to be unpacking. First, we see who it's from. We see it's from Peter. Now, Peter uh, was just an ordinary dude back in the day, but Peter got to know somebody extraordinary. Peter hung out with Jesus Christ. He spent three years living with, traveling with, working alongside, and learning from Jesus. He's what, one of the people we call his disciples. Now, Peter here, he understands Jesus' message. He heard Jesus talking about the kingdom in which he is the king of. And he ultimately associates himself here and gives himself a title of one that, that is a servant of the king. Here, listen, he says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. That's another way of saying that, hey, hey, I'm King Jesus' sent one. I'm his messenger. I'm declaring the news of the kingdom. And what that tells us is this. As we, as we dig into 1 Peter, we're digging not into just Peter's words. We're digging into a message from our king. And, and, and who, who is this intended to reach? You see it right there. All right? It's from Peter, an apostle of Jesus, but it's, it's written to the elect exiles of the dispersion. And then there's a bunch of, bunch of towns that are hard to pronounce, all currently in modern-day Turkey. Okay? So he, here, here, here he is, and he gives them this title to those who are elect exiles. That needs a little bit of breaking down. Okay? So first off, elect is like, hey, hey, you are the ones that God has lovingly chosen to be a part of his kingdom. He chose you. He loved you. And he, and he sovereignly brought about a plan to make you his own and a part of his kingdom. But the, so that, that's a sweet identity for these people as they're hearing that. But there's also another identity found in here. They are exiles. Now, I, I would be one, this, is, this word might be translated something different in your, in your Bible, I would be one that would lean towards a translation of aliens. Because it isn't necessarily that they weren't a part, they got kicked out of their land and their exiles, but this, the whole, throughout this whole book is this idea that they, they are home. I mean, they're foreigners, they're, they're strangers, they're sojourners. In, in other words, while they might be residences of these towns, they, they have a citizenship that surpasses that. They, they, they aren't just from Aurelia, so to speak. They're members, they're, they're citizens of the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus is their king. And in, and in this way, we, we see that it's not just for them. It's not just for people in modern-day Turkey way back in the day. That, that little title, elect exiles, that's for you, Christian. That means that you, though you might feel like you're sitting in your home, on your couch, you're not in your forever home. And you're not just a citizen of Canada. You're a citizen of the kingdom to come. And you have another king. You're a sojourner. You're an alien. You're a foreigner. Here in this temporary residence. Now, to be clear, okay, the, the idea of, of being an alien here or, or an exile here, to not be home here, is nothing like the idea of going to Florida on vacation. Okay? That's nice, that's planned, that, that's all rosy, and hopefully if the kids behave, it's going to be a really good time, right? But in this situation, you're, it, it's not a vacation. 
The church that's being addressed here, the church in those particular towns, is either in the midst of a hard season, a suffering season, or, or Peter in, in some way is preparing them for what he knows is about to hit these guys hard. The, these people we are going to experience are, are in the midst of extreme suffering. Now, I would be one that would be a proponent that would suggest that, that everybody that walks this earth maybe in varying levels, maybe in different seasons, we, we get suffering. Since the fall of mankind, things have been broken here. Things are difficult here. They can get lonely here. It, there, there is a soul violation that is felt by everybody. It doesn't matter if they're Christian or non-Christian. They share your worldview or not. They feel in their heart. They know in their gut. Something, something's off. Something is wrong. Things aren't the way that they should be. Anybody at home suffered before? Maybe... Maybe you're suffering right now. Maybe this season has been difficult for you. I want to encourage you to pick up this letter to a suffering church and read it and ingest it and read it again and ask the Lord for insight. Because friends, what I believe is that you can hear the voice of Jesus, the voice of your king, through, through this letter from Peter. And he has words for you in the midst of that difficult season you find yourself in. He has life-giving, spirit-inspired words for the suffering in this, in this book. And I certainly hope that you pick it up. and Because I, I think that when you, when you read it, you're going to hear your King Jesus saying, Love one. Loved one, don't be surprised by the pain. Don't be distracted in this season. Loved one, don't be discouraged. I'm with you right now. I'm here for you today. And I've got a great tomorrow, a lasting hope ready for you tomorrow. I think... I think these churches, the people, the members in it would understand where you're at. In fact, in, in chapter 4, there's a reference to a fiery trial. Now, in, in many ways, we might associate that with, oh, there must be extreme difficulty. But you need to understand that in this time, some of them may have gone on to experience a fiery trial, quite literally. My hope for us today is that we can draw, as they no doubt did, encouragement from God's word. See, they, they needed this letter from their king. They needed, as it says here, they needed a word of grace and peace to be multiplied to them. And certainly we may need that. You may find yourself in need of that today. And in fact, that's what, that's what this book is about that's the what of 1 Peter. This is all instruction to these churches, okay, that they might have a hope-filled word from their king, a word of grace and a, and a word of peace in the midst of their suffering to know that their king hasn't forgotten about them and he is there for them in the midst of the trial. And you're going to see three things if you, if you take the time to read this, which I hope you do. You're going to see three things that he really camps on in this letter. I, I, let, me, let me just point them out here. First off, you're going to see that, that he calls them to remember the good news with joy. Remember the good news. What is the good news? Jesus is coming soon, and he's going to make everything right again. And that, my friends, is the good news. That which is broken will be broken no longer. He will restore all things. You're going to see, number two, that he, he, he asks them to resolve, to represent their king well. 
That, that, that means to, to be holy as he's holy. He calls them into that, calls them into submission to authorities in their life, just as he exemplified for us. And ultimately, he calls us to a, to a gracious living in our time of exile, our time of being a foreigner, a stranger, a sojourner here. And then last, you see, that he calls us to love our fellow citizens well. Love one another, church. That, my friends, is what we're going to be camping on in chapter 4. My hope is there you can turn that page over and turn to chapter 4, but, but I don't want to just rush into it right now. I think we do that too often. We rush into things. This is an opportunity. This is an opportunity for the Spirit to take the word that he authored and to cut it to our hearts and to show us what his will is for us. Let's go before him. I hope that wherever you are, you're going to bow with me. You're going to close your eyes. You're going to focus. And you're going to pray along with me. Let's pray. Our Father, we, uh, we recognize our need for you. Lord, we need the Holy Spirit today. We need our comforter today. We need, our, we need instruction from your word today. Lord, there's people right now that need to know their king cares today. I pray that you let them know that you're with them. Lord God, use your word in the, only, in the way that only you understand. Do miracles in hearts today, I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, First Peter, we're going we're gonna to start in uh, chapter 4, verse 7. That's going to be our text today. And there you're, you're going to see that he's going to address the big picture. He's going to give a command. He's going to give uh, the method of fulfilling that command. And ultimately, he's going to end with the reason why all of this. Okay, and I'm excited to unpack it with you. I hope you're there with me in verse 7. Let's read together. Why don't you turn your eyes to the word of God with me. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks is the one who speaks the oracles of God. Whoever serves is the one who serves by the strength that God supplies. In order that, in everything... God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. That's our king, right? To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen and amen. Now, there's a lot there, and it's a loaded passage, but why don't we walk through this and unpack it together. First, we see the big picture. Look at verse 7, the very beginning. The end of all things is at hand. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read that, I think of the dude with the sign, right? The end is near, right? And it's like apocalyptic, and we're like, oh my goodness, this is scary news. But you need to understand that this is a word of comfort to the suffering. The end of this season, this temporary stay, it's going to be soon. And he's going to make everything right soon. Your pain will be over soon. And that is comforting, amen? And he keeps going. The end is the end's near, right? The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. In the original language, saying being self-controlled and sober-minded, that's like saying the same thing twice, all right? What he's trying to say to the Christian here is this. Hey, hey Christian, don't get drunk or get distracted by the world. I mean, you're here for a moment. Don't get intoxicated with the pleasures here. Instead, it's like an echo of of chapter 1, verse 13, where he says this, prepare your mind for action, for good action, being sober-minded. See it? Being sober-minded. Set your hope fully on the grace that we brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Remember the big picture. This is temporary. He's coming soon, and he's going to make everything right. And that, my friends, is eternity. This is the temporary residence. So like Jesus, we're encouraged in chapter 4, verse 1, we're to arm ourselves with the same way of thinking. 
When Jesus went through suffering, when Jesus went through the cross, what are we told in God's word that he did? It was the joy that was set before him that allowed him to endure the suffering of the cross well. And in the same way, we have a joy set before us that allows us to endure the temporary sufferings in order to look forward to the glory that is coming. There's another time in this, path, in this uh, letter that he encourages us to be sober-minded. It says in, verse, in chapter 5, verse 8, be sober-minded, okay? Be watchful. Why? Because Satan is in this temporary residence, roaming around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And friend, Christian, what I can tell you is this. He wants his prey drunk. He wants them to not be sober-minded. He wants them to be distracted. He wants them to be consumed, chasing worldly, temporary pleasures. So watch out, brothers and sisters. Sober up. Keep the big picture in mind. Flee the temptations He throws your way and stay fixed on the goal. And remember that upward calling in Christ. These words, friends, it provides us an opportunity today. They may sound like hard words, but it's, it's, it's loving words from our King providing us an opportunity to check ourselves to consider what, what have I been putting my mind on? What actions have I made myself ready for? Am I sober? Are you sober? I mean, are, you can ask these questions of yourself. Are, are you remembering the big picture? I mean, I mean, is that your motivation for what you do each day, keeping the end in mind? According to Philippians, the mature think that way. Who, what have you been putting your hope in in this season? Who, what are you going to for satisfaction in this season? For maybe saving in this season? Another way of asking all those questions in one is a, is a question I ask regularly. Do you live to see Jesus? Do you live today to see Jesus? Is that what governs? Is that what fuels you? If you're not sure, if you're doing some self-assessment and you're coming up empty here right now, in this unique season that we've experienced lately, what have you filled your days with? I mean, what is your schedule like? How do you use your time, your talent, your treasures? Are you seeking a home here to take a permanent residence here? Or are you seeking another residence, aliens? What are you pursuing? What, what are you valuing the most? What are you treasuring the most? Can moth and rust destroy it? Can it be taken away? Can thieves break in and steal it? See, friends, where your treasure is, there your heart, or, or there your desires will be also. I hope, as you do the assessment, that call, God calls you into sober-mindedness. And then we see, not, not just remember the big picture here, in light of the big picture, our king gives us a gracious command. It's a command that he exemplified for us, and, and it ought to be priority for his citizens as well. Let's look at it in verse 8. It says this, Above all, pause, okay? When you've read through a letter from somebody and all of a sudden they're like, okay, okay, everything I said, pay attention to this. This is kind of like the alarm bell. Above all, above all what? Keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sin. Okay, so above all, do what? Love. Now, 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 to the Bible reader, this, this isn't a strange concept. You see it in the Old Testament. You certainly see Jesus championing it. He makes sure that we know the first greatest commandment is to love God, and the second is to love other people. All right? So that doesn't catch us off guard, but there's two words that I really want to highlight in that statement. It's, it, says, it says, keep loving one another earnestly. What this says to us is this, that, that love takes endurance. 
It takes intentionality. It's something that, that, that doesn't always come easy. In other words, friend, wherever you're sitting, you are hard to love. Now, if you're sitting beside somebody, hopefully there was no amen, all right? But here's the deal. We are difficult to love. It takes endurance. It takes us earnestly pursuing love to keep on keeping on with love in order to love one another. In fact, if you've been paying attention to the news, you see this everywhere. Love does not come naturally. Hate comes naturally. But God, our King, has shown us and equipped us on how to love. And we are to keep pursuing it. And the fact that this is said to these churches says to us as the church, love is something we need to keep aware of. It's something that could naturally fade amongst us, especially when, when the suffering ramps up. Sometimes it's, it becomes far easier to go inward instead of outward. Sometimes, sometimes we let love fade. But why, why is this here? Why is this command here? This command is here because our king knows that we need, we need one another in this time of suffering, in this sojourning, in this alien existence. We need our fellow aliens. We need this because we, we, we need each other to remind us of the big picture. So how? How then do we love? We get it, right? Love one another. This is what our, what our God, what our King wants us to do. How then? What's the method? What's the method of, to fulfill this command? Method number one is this. We see it in verse 9. Show hospitality. All right? So I, I like this because it's super simple, all right? When, when you're in the midst of suffering, have people over. Be with people. Get into each other's lives. Have somebody cross the threshold into your house when possible, of course, right? But have somebody over. Get in each other's life. Do life together, friends. Be citizens. Encourage one another. Get together. Show hospitality. In other words, the instruction is invite fellow aliens into your home. Hang out with them. Not bad, right? But I love, I love the tag that he puts there because this shows me my king gets it without grumbling. All right, so, so he, he knows, he knows. When, when you invite somebody in, this ain't an easy thing. All right, this, this is difficult. It's expensive if you want to have someone over for dinner, right? It, it takes time, and people tend to linger, right? Uh, sometimes a little too long, right? Okay. And people make a mess of your home, but not only that, but if you're going to get into each other's lives, people are messy. You are messy, Part of why it's so difficult to love you, right? But we, we make a mess wherever we go, right? So we, we, need to, we need to show hospitality without grumbling. And then the last thing I just want to point out is people can be tiring. Can I get an amen? Someone's saying an amen on the other side of the screen. I know it right now, okay? But it, or else it's just me, and I'm the one that really needs to get the heart check here today, okay? But here's the thing. People wear you out sometimes. But he, our, our, our king is calling us into this because he knows we need it. He knows that something changes when we show hospitality to one another. Something, something changes when you cross that threshold into somebody's life, into somebody's home. You start to care for that person differently. You start to, you start to want to be there for them, to share with them differently. You, you start to love them deeper when you show hospitality. It's good, right? We need that community in this foreign experience. But the question then is, do you value it? I mean, friends, is hospitality on the menu after all this is over? Is hospitality a, a regular part of your life? So friends, the, the, the world will get you intoxicated. It will put other things on the menu. It will distract you. It will disorient you. It will make you want to think selfishly because that's what it does. The opposite of love is this selfish desire, and it, it will fuel that in you. Let's make sure that this is a priority. This is why I love, I talked to Dave about this. I, I love that your church is all about these mission groups, doing life together style groups. We need that, right? We need those people in our kitchen, in our lives, reminding us and keeping us accountable of God, to God's word and ultimately, ultimately making sure that we're sober. That we're, we're still seeing straight. We're still, we're still remembering the big picture. 
The word of God is, is so constant about this. But there's a, there's a particular passage in, in the book of Proverbs. Proverbs 18, verse 1. It offers us some wisdom about this idea of being with other people. It says this. Whoever isolates himself seeks his own desire. In other words, if you're isolating yourself, I know there's like a self-isolation thing here and they could play on isolation, okay, whatever. But the idea is you're trying to do life alone, you're seeking your own desire. That's the opposite of love, okay? But then what does it say? He breaks out against all sound judgment. In other words, he's not thinking right. He's not sober-minded if he's doing that. He's, he's being dumb. And I've been there before. I've been the dumb guy in this, okay? Trying to do life by myself. Just gird, gird up myself. I can do this. I can do this. And you fall flat on your face, friends. It's not wise. It's, it's dumb. And the Word of God calls us not to individualism, but to a community. Because we need closeness in this foreign experience. We need someone to, to encourage us. We need someone to build us up. We need it together. This is even more important in this isolation season where people are off by themselves. They need you right now. They need your love, your encouragement, even right now. Friends, we aren't just made for a personal relationship with God. Yeah, he can be my Lord and personal Savior, but he has called us to a citizenship. He has called us to a family. He's called us to a body, and we are to be radically united, completely together. We're to be one. We need one another. We need to share the word, share his spirit, share his love together. We, we need this. And, and friends, your church, your church has often offered mission groups to make sure this is a regular part of your schedule. And I would just say this. If it, it's not something that you have made time for before, make sure you make time for it in the future. It might cost you something, but you will always come out the better for it. Why can I say that? Because this, this command from, from our Lord keeps that in mind, and he knows what's best. The question then today is, are you going to do that? Are you going to make an action point out of this? Are you going to call the office? Are you going to talk to somebody you know who leads a group? Are you going to get there? Are you going to do life with other Christians? Friends, our, our, our king knows we need it. That's why he put it here. And then there's love method number two I would refer to. So first, you, the idea of hospitality. That's how you love one another, all right, in this, foreign, in this foreign place. Another way to love one another is verse 10, serve one another. Serve one another. Notice, though, what's around it here, okay? Each has received a gift. That means regardless of, of whether or not you think you have something to contribute, you have something to contribute, or God is a liar. Okay, it doesn't matter what your thought processes are on the, on, on the spiritual gifts. He's gifted you to contribute, to serve somebody with in this church. So, you've got a gift. What does it tell you to do? Use it. Use it. Look at it. Use it to serve one another. Do something with it. The question then comes, am I doing that? Am I sharing the gift that God has given me? Then, then there's some people that get paralyzed. Well, wait a second, wait, 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 wait. I don't know what gift I have. What spiritual gift do I have? How do I, how do I function like that? Well, then serve somebody somewhere. My encouragement to you is if you serve somebody somewhere, pay attention, you're going to see. You're going to see. The Holy Spirit's going to give you a passion for a particular element of that, okay? And he's going to give you an excellence for a particular element of service. Just watch. You get serving, he starts showing you what your gift is. It's a beautiful thing. I really hope, I really hope, though, that you take your king up on this and you use your gifts and you serve one another. What I can guarantee is this. When you give, you get, right? And another thing I can guarantee is this. Your service is needed by somebody here. Every part of the body is important. And it's when, and when all of us are doing our thing that the body builds itself up. It grows and it, it represents our king well. We need you to contribute here in order that this church represents its king well and it expands the kingdom well in Aurelia. And who doesn't want that, right? We want that. So let's all do our part. Let's use our gifts. And I can also guarantee another Another thing, I know I've made two guarantees already. Right, three guarantees, watch, watch this. If you serve, and I believe our king knows this, your love for the people you serve is going to grow. 
you're going to feel more a part of things here. You're going to feel more a part of people. You're going to have better connections with your brothers and sisters in Christ here. And, and, and our king knows that you need that. So I believe that's part of why he gave this command to serve one another. So make a step. Ask a question. Reach out to somebody. Start serving. Maybe you're not sure how. Brainstorm. We do that all the time. Talk to somebody. How can I serve somebody? They're, they'll come up with ideas. Let me tell you, the, the need for one another is large. But I also love that he doesn't just say, just serve and, re- and receive your check mark. Okay, okay. You serve and you get this little gold star on this little chart here. No, that's not how it works. That's worldly, okay? They, 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 we're aliens here. This is how it tells us to serve. Whoever speaks as one who speaks the oracles of God. Whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. Do you see what's going on here? Do you see what's happening? He's saying, serve your king with excellence because you have the Holy Spirit's power within you to reveal him as glorious through your service. But now now we're starting to get into the why. Why all of this, okay? Why stay sober-minded? Why fight the flesh? Why go after love? Why why do all these these loving acts towards people in this this experience of suffering, in this experience of of sorrow or, or fatigue, in the midst of all of that? Why do those things? Look at verse 11 with me. Turn your eyes there, please. And you're going to see in the second half of verse 11, it says this, in order that... Get it? In order, all this, in order that, in everything, God may be glorified. This, this life, then, isn't about me and my comfort and my glory that I can get. All right? This isn't about, this isn't about John's status, and my service certainly shouldn't be for John's status, or it shouldn't be about my comfort or what I can attain. It's about giving him all the props and worthy, the worthiness and glory that he is due. He Oh, that's what life is supposed to be about. That's what my life should be about. It should be honoring my king and glorifying him in every single way. Look what it says. Look what it says. We, we, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. That's our king. To him belong. Not to me. Not to John. To him belong the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Is that who? Is that what your life is about? Really, think about it. Is your heart's desire, this is a check for me, is your heart's desire the glory of God above all things? Is that what, is that what you spend your strength, your, your time, your talent, your treasure on? Is that, what you're, is that what you're doing with your plans today, for your plans tomorrow, and your plans whenever this crisis stuff ends? Check them out. Why are you doing what you're doing? Is it for his glory and his glory alone? Friends, we can even do a good thing for our glory, not his glory. So, friend, uh, just as a final appeal, if you will, really all this boils down to this. It's an invitation It's an invitation from our king to you. It's not an invitation from me. Will you, will you live like an alien for your king today? And not just you. Will you live with us as an alien for the king today? Loved ones, my hope for you is that this has been a part of sobering you up giving you a chance to check your values to make sure that they're straight. Friends, know this, know this. We need you. Your king needs you. And he's called you to action, to love, by opening up your homes, by getting in, into a life-on-life style of living, getting into those mission groups and, and serving each other for the glory of God above your own. I just want to leave you with uh, two verses. They're found in 1 Peter chapter 5. Just look, just, just pan over with me to verse 10. It says this. And after you have suffered a little while, see how phrases our, our time here? It's just a little while. After you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his, listen, eternal glory, temporary suffering, eternal glory in Christ 
will himself, in person, restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Anyone need some more strength? He's going to do it. To him be the dominion. Why? Because he's king. Forever and ever. Amen. Will you bow with me? Let's pray. Our Father, I, uh, I'm thankful for your word. Thankful for your, your message through your sent one. A message of grace and a message of peace. Lord, we need more of you more of your grace, more of your peace, more of your spirit at work within us. So Lord, I pray that your word would take root in our hearts. Lord, I'm thankful for uh, this chapter 5 reference, Lord God. It it reminds me of Revelation when your word says that the dwelling place of God is with man. And and, and he's going to be our God. We're going to be his people. He's going to rule. Our king's coming. He's going to be amongst us. And And he will wipe away every tear. Death will be no more. There's no more pain. There's no no more riots. There's no more more suffering people that are alone in this season. No more of that. Because our king has returned. Lord, look forward to that day. Help us all look forward to that today. Today. In the meantime, give us, give us right-mindedness. Give us your values. Give us your strength to live for your glory that the name of Jesus might go out to all of Aurelia, that we might represent him together and you might get the glory. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <laughs>
Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you, Lord. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none besides you. Open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Sing Jesus. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you, Lord, say holy. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none besides you. Open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. I will put my trust in you alone. And I will not be shaken. I church family, I hope that that was more than just a song that you just sang. Uh, we truly want to be a church that allows our lives to be built on the solid rock of Jesus Christ. And again, just to echo what John just shared with us in, in, in 1 Peter, uh, we want to encourage you that if you're not a part of a missional community, or if you're interested in joining a missional community, to, to reach out to us, to, to email Josh Gray, uh, or to reach out to the church office. We would love to plug you into a missional community and get you connected uh, to our church family. Well, I pray that you have encountered Jesus Christ this morning. We are looking forward to seeing what next Sunday looks like. We may be, uh, some people may be here in the auditorium. We may not have already got there, um, but we are looking forward to worshiping with you either online or, or in person, either recorded or live stream. We'll let you know this week. God bless you. We'll see you next Sunday.